speaker is Andrea Weisse, and uh, she's going to talk about mechanistic models of bacterial growth. Um, thanks very much. Do you hear me well? All right, so I will talk about um, yet another approach of uh, modeling bacterial growth. Um, perhaps most similar to what Sanjay presented uh, yesterday. Um, right, so just uh, before I start, um, I wanted to mention that um, in, in my group, um, what we do is we, we work um, to use our skills um, and do our humble bid uh, to try and uh, tackle uh, um, the AMR crisis, the resistance crisis. So we do this um, uh, not only at the level of uh, bacterial physiology, we also work um, at kind of the patient level um, uh, where we work with clinicians to kind of uh, understand how transmission of the worst forms of antibiotic resistance works in hospitals. Um, so this is pretty much data driven, whereas like most of what we do at the cellular level is, um, um, is kind of an, a mechanistic approach. So you've seen that in Holly's talk um, on Tuesday um, on the RNA repair um, and trying to understand how that influences tolerance. There's also a poster outside uh, by Elena um, where we're trying to better understand uh, antibiotic responses and the dose responses. Um, so um, another uh, project uh, that we're working on, um, which is not mechanistic, uh, but rather data driven, is uh, one by Emily, um, where we're looking at uh, the early adaptive response um, of um, MRSA, so methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, um, and the role of different RNases in um, and uh, dynamically adapting to a host environment. Um, so um, our mechanistic um, uh, projects are mainly based around um, this approach uh, that I will um, uh, present to you now, uh, which is about, um, ah, before, before I start with that. So um, if you find that things uh, I present here or things that you hear from Elena and Holly are interesting to you, uh, please talk to us. Uh, we do have PhD openings and, um, and also spread the word if you find that there might be candidates uh, uh, who might be interested. Um, right. So um, basically uh, the, the models that we work with, we see them sort of as a framework to predict growth rate um, uh, in response to different kinds of inputs or perturbations. So those uh, inputs could be different kinds of nutrient environments or drugs that they are exposed to, as well as gen genetic modifications. Um, um, the framework that we want to look at should ideally be dynamic um, and, um, right, and, and and uh, what, what I will talk about now will be split in, in two parts. So in the first uh, part, um, I will talk about uh, a framework that we developed um, of uh, uh, modeling uh, bacterial growth responses um, deterministically, so sort of uh, the, uh, the average responses of cells in a population. And the second part then will focus on um, uh, single cell responses and and how stochasticity drives heterogeneous responses um, in growth. Um, before I run out of time, I'd also like to um, uh, thank my coworkers on those projects. Um, so those are mainly spread between Edinburgh and Imperial College, which were the two places I've been uh, flip-flopping uh, between, um, with the exception of Vincent, who deserted us um, to the front. Um, Right. Um, so um, we've seen a lot of different approaches, and um, obviously we know that um, there's um, a lot of uh, a lot of um, activity going on in the cell, and uh, and it's highly complex. And, and we're trying to coarse grain this in some way, right? And there are, there are various approaches that we've already seen here uh, at the workshop. Um, um, 
um, and, and for us now the choice was which, which kind of avenue to go for um, with the goal that we had of, um, of, of, of predicting um, uh, emergent responses. <clears throat> so, um, as I said already, um, um, with, uh, with the inclusion of different kinds of perturbations or, or inputs, actually a mechanistic approach lends itself very well um, uh, to, to this. And, um, and so although we've, um, we've actually taken a lot of input from the kinds of approaches that Terry uh, has presented and has developed, um, so we decided to, um, to go for a mechanistic approach, which, um, um, which uh, kind of, on, on this slide, the, the, the only truly mechanistic model that you see here is uh, the, the whole cell model uh, where, where there's an attempt of modeling everything in, this, in the cell, which, which was also not the avenue we wanted to go for. The last approach down in the bottom uh, is, is, uh, is one that in, in terms of the coarse grainness was actually most appealing to us, but um, it was still based on optimization, which was something that uh, we, we wanted to shy away from. So, um, so the approach that we took um, was uh, one that had a very similar level of coarse graining as, uh, as the third approach that I've showed you, shown you there. Um, but um, instead of um, uh, relying on optimization, we, we wanted to fully uh, remain mechanistic. So the model um, that, uh, that we developed here is, is one that um, largely builds on the central dogma. And um, the central dogma um, based around a coarse-grained uh, genome, um, much uh, inspired by, uh, by the works of Matt Scott and Terawa. Um, so um, this uh, basically describing the central dogma on this coarse-grained uh, genome um, dynamically and, and then combining it with some sort of nutrient and energy influx. So the import of a nutrient, its conversion to energy that can then be used to fuel the biosynthesis of proteins. And um, we focused our modeling approach on three fundamental um, constraints that all living cells uh, will face. So uh, one is that they will only have a finite amount of energetic resources that we force grain with this one species A here. Um, they all rely on a finite uh, pool of ribosomes for their protein biosynthesis. And then um, their proteome is finite and it needs to um, uh, include all the proteins um, that the cell needs to perform the different tasks. Now I will show you now, I will go through how we implemented um, those different um, constraints. So in the first one um, about the finite pool of energy, so basically we, we build this model as an ordinary differential equation model where we describe the temporal evolution of the different species. So here it's this energy um, species and, and this basically comes in at a rate that depends on the enzyme concentration of this green guy here uh, as well as the, the concentration of the internal uh, nutrient. Um, and, and then to, to model different kinds of nutrient environments, um, we have this uh, parameter that basically tells us how much energy do we get out from, uh, from that type of nutrient. Um, um, and then we have all the processes that are feeding from uh, this energy resource. And here we're making um, a huge simplification. We do assume that it is only uh, translation that uh, dominates um, energy consumption. And, um, um, and this is uh, based on uh, some estimates that's, that uh, stated that, um, that uh, energy consumption by translation is around 70%. Um, of, of the energy budget. So, um, and then finally, all our cellular species are being diluted uh, through growth of the cell. Right, um, we have a mechanistic derivation as well 
of the translation rate of the different species that we're considering. So for, uh, for that derivation, we're considering um, a, um, a mechanism where basically a ribosome by, bound to an mRNA um, can reversibly bind to the energetic resource or like, uh, and, and, and then once it's bound, elongation, one elongation step can happen. So obviously this has to happen n times with n the number of amino acids in that protein. And then uh, at, at the end, the, um, the peptide is released and the complex falls apart. Um, and, and so we do not model all of this explicitly. We only use it to derive the net rate of uh, translation, which then uh, turns out to be this kind of Michaelis Menten type um, uh, um, kinetic, um, where we have a maximal translational elongation rate and sort of an energy threshold uh, at which um, elongation is half maximal. And further, it, um, it uh, depends on the levels of bound ribosomes of that type of mRNA, as well as uh, the length of that protein. Um, right, so in the next trade-off, uh, we, um, we look at uh, the, the finite number of ribosomes. And for that, first, uh, we, we need to model how um, mRNAs are being transcribed and then how they com competitively bind uh, free ribosomes. So, um, so here uh, we have the equation for uh, the, the free mRNAs uh, being produced through transcription and through the same logic as I showed you in the, in the previous slide about translation, we can argue that each elongation step in transcription consumes a finite amount of uh, energy, even though we neglect it, we can assume this kind of uh, same shape of the function, of the trans, uh, transcription function. And then um, I want to emphasize that we have those parameters, theta here, uh, that principally uh, can apply to all different genes. Um, but uh, in, in, in our, um, in our framework, we, um, we infer them for ribosomal and non-ribosomal genes separately. And, um, and only for um, the, um, the kind of housekeeping uh, uh, proteins that, um, that are supposed to have uh, a more or less stable uh, uh, concentration throughout different growth uh, conditions, we assume this kind of uh, negative autoregulation. Um, uh, that keeps them more or less stable. And then the way we implement uh, the constraint in, in uh, ribosomes is um, in the equation of the free ribosomes where, um, where basically, apart from the production and dilution, obviously, we have to sum over all the processes that either take away uh, free ribosomes or feed back into the pool of free ribosomes. So, and that um, is basically uh, summing over all, all possible genes that, uh, all possible mRNA types that uh, ribosomes can interact with. And we have um, the binding of uh, mRNAs and free ribosomes, as well as their unbinding, and, and then the free up at the end of translation. Right, and finally, um, we have uh, the constraint on uh, the, the finite mass of, um, of the cell. Again, here we're assuming that uh, this mass is only made up of, uh, of protein. And we can sum up, basically, uh, our, our total mass of the cell. Um, so this is given, basically, by, by looking at um, all, all the different uh, proteins that we have and multiplying them by their length. So we're, um, we're considering the mass as a total of amino acids uh, incorporated into the proteome. And then obviously we also have to consider the ribosomes that are being bound by mRNAs. Um, so uh, when, when we write this, we can then also write um, the, um, the ODE 
for the mass, and, and that obviously um, is, de um, is determined by how much protein is being produced, and, and then uh, how much it is being, how much of the mass is being diluted through growth. Um, now, so here we still have this um, kind of undetermined growth rate, um, and um, and uh, it is um, it is quite obvious that uh, when we set uh, m to zero, so we are at kind of steady state growth, then uh, this mass is not the total mass. It's uh, because it's being diluted, so it's like a concentration. Um, yeah, so... It's different from yeah, models. Yeah, I mean, we're not considering volume. We're, we're kind of considering that... Uh, that mass is proportional to volume, but this M, I should think of it as a fraction or a concentration, as a mass fraction or a concentration. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Um, uh, right. So, obviously, when we set this uh, to zero, then we get that lambda... Um, should be uh, uh, should be proportional to uh, sh should be equal to um, the the total translation rate divided by the current mass, and um, and to define uh, this rate uh, dynamically, we uh, um, we set um, the the dynamic growth rate to the the total translation rate divided by um, a mass that we take as the typical mass of an exponentially growing cell. And then what we guarantee is that at steady state, so at balanced growth, uh, we will reach that typical mass. Um, right, so um, this is this just to show you how the full model then looks. We have um, a set of coupled ODEs here, um, we have, except for this auto-inhibition term uh, in, uh, in, the, in the housekeeping uh, transcription, uh, we have no sort of switching functions or anything. Um, and overall, we then have 14 ODEs, so basically three ODEs uh, per, per gene that we're considering in terms of the free mRNA, the bound mRNA to the ribosome, and then the protein, um, plus um, plus the internal nutrient as well as the energy. Now, obviously, this model has a lot of parameters, and, um, uh, but, but the advantage of, of this mechanistic approach is that we could actually harvest quite a lot of those parameters from the literature, and the parameters that we were left to infer um, were, uh, were actually uh, those associated with the expression of this kind of coarse-grained um, of those coarse grain genome sectors. Um, right, so um, we used the data from Terry's lab um, to, to fit our model. And uh, what you see here is um, those lines are, um, those lines are uh, simulations based on samples from our posterior distribution of the uh, parameters. And, um, and overall, we see that a lot of different parameter values seem to produce um, this, this, uh, this behavior very robustly. And we could also look at the, the, um, the actual values of those parameters, and we saw that like, there was a huge range of variation uh, in the actual parameters. So um, this, this was a very robust behavior, um, which then led us to actually um, derive uh, those growth laws um, analytically from, from the model, um, and, um, and we could, which I guess is not so surprising anymore, we could also see that from, uh, from Sanjay's model yesterday, which um, has, has kind of the same structure, um, although um, we fleshed it out a bit more with mechanisms. So, and, um, and then what this allows us is to kind of derive the, um, the relationships where we can um, we can determine the parameters in those growth relationships. We can link them back to parameters in, uh, in our model. So, for example, here the slope um, related to the time 
um, it takes to translate a ribosome, so kind of um, the efficiency of the ribosome. This is something that Terry also mentioned already. Um, um, and then uh, the second growth law when inhibiting translation, we could uh, relate it back to the efficiency of the enzymes. We, um, the amount of housekeeping load that we need to uh, produce. And, um, um, and, and then finally, also related to um, the, the previous talk now, um, the, the mono growth, where we found that the maximal growth rate depends heavily on, on the housekeeping load, um, as well as um, the, the enzymatic and, and the ribosomal um, efficiency. Um, right. Um, so we we uh, we also use this model now um, to 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 study different um, systems. So as an example um, of one system uh, where where we kind of um, use the model con to contextualize, provide a cellular context to systems that are often um, studied in isolation and that may behave very differently when we actually um, uh, consider them within a dynamic uh, environment of a cell. So one example that we saw uh, on Tuesday was Holly's uh, RNA repair system, which we're trying to currently in integrate into, into this growth framework to kind of see how, um, how uh, her system um, um, dynamically interacts with the growth apparatus and, and kind of uh, invokes those different kinds of uh, um, tolerance states. Um, um, obviously, as I told you in the very beginning, we're very interested in antibiotic responses. So, um, so this framework really allows us to, to model how the different antibiotics tackle different um, spots, targets inside the cell. And, um, and um, um, the, the framework has also been taken up quite a lot uh, by the synthetic biology community, or I have to say now, engineering biology community. It's what we have to say in the UK now. Um, so where basically um, people use it to, uh, to quantify the interaction of um, the synthetic circuits that they build um, with the host cell and kind of quantify the burden that they impose on the cell as well um, as the, the, the limits, how, how the host physiology constrains the, uh, the performance of the synthetic circuits. <clears throat> and um, I'm aware this, I, I, I'll mention it. I know this is kind of makes me a target here, but um, uh, we've also used it um, to, um, to model compet competition um, experiments. Um, so um, I believe this is really uh, um, a very flexible framework that uh, allows us to modularly um, put um, different aspects that one might be interested uh, in together and, and investigate them. Right, so um, if there are no questions for this part, I'll move on to the second part. So, um, um, so we, we know that uh, the growth of single cells can uh, vary quite a lot. So what you see here is um, the, the growth trajectories of individual cells, and you can see that those differ quite a lot in uh, like how fast they grow, how big they grow, uh, et cetera. Um, but also, if we look at the growth rate, of individual cells, then those can vary considerably over time. And this variation of growth rates um, can be influenced uh, um, as well by the, the environments that the cells are um, exposed to. Now, why is this interesting? This is interesting to us because uh, um, it can have quite an impact in, the real, um, in real environments when, when cells are exposed to antibiotics and when they might uh, um, ex uh, display tolerance to, to antibiotics, which then leaves the treatment ineffective. Um, so um, the, the framework 
Ah, the, um, the reason traditionally people believe is uh, how, uh, how heterogeneity among isogenic cells arises is through gene expression because it is the process where we have uh, mRNAs at very low copy numbers and, um, and um, this then typically results in a variation of levels uh, at the protein level and then, and then this can uh, uh, lead to different phenotypic responses, right? Um, this has been studied extensively, uh, but typically at the level of a single gene or maybe a combination of a few genes. Now we're looking at this uh, messy system. Um, and, um, and to study, um, to study how variation in some of these components lead to variation in growth rate, we again go back to our framework, but now we consider it um, in a stochastic setting. So um, I apologize, it's a different figure, but it's exactly the same reaction, it's the, exactly the same species. Um, and now we consider every reaction as a stochastic reaction. So this really allows us to not impose stochasticity phenomenologically, but kind of um, predict um, its emergent effects from, from first principles. Um, now, um, I think at the single cell level, it's not enough to only uh, consider um, stochastic reaction kinetics, but a major stochastic event uh, in the cell is also cell division. So, um, what we did for that is we coupled this stochastic growth model with an established um, cell cycle model, um, uh, which is the Donnecke model. So basically, um, we coupled cell growth to uh, DNA replication, where we used um, uh, the Donnecke model, which basically says that um, um, a new round of replication is initiated whenever the, the, the initiation mass is, um, is passed, or the way we interpreted it was that the concentration of DNA origins goes be below a certain threshold. Um, once... Uh, uh, One comment. So there, there's a lot of uh, single cell data that challenges this initiation model. Probably it's irrelevant for, what, for your purposes, but just to mention. So um, after initiation, then there's um, a fixed period of time it takes for the cell to replicate um, the chromosome. This is called the C period. And after uh, termination of replication, so basically when the replication fork reaches this yellow point here, um, uh, um, there's the D phase, the division phase, where the cell prepares for division, most likely. Um, and, and, and those we considered fixed. I know there's also some contention about that. Um, sorry? By your model into models that resemble what you actually measure in single cells, which are sort of equivalently complex. Um, so, um, this now allows us to simulate the growth and division of a cell lineage um, um, over time. Ah, also, I, just, just to clarify how we do the division. So, there are different ways of doing uh, that, and basically we assume that we have the cell as a bag of different types of molecules, and, um, and what we do is then... Um, that we, uh, we uh, say that the cell decides on a septum position where the cell will uh, divide, the, and, and that septum position will, on average, be one half. Um, 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 but there is some variation around that, and we found that this, this little bit of variation was actually important to uh, reproduce some of the data that we looked at. And then once this kind of um, this proportion of the daughter cell uh, is, um, is determined, then we do a binomial partitioning of all the different chemical species um, separately. 
um, with that proportion. Um, right, so now we can stochastically grow our cell, we can divide it and we can simulate it over time. So here you see one such simulation where we can see the, how fluctuations in some uh, mRNA species might have like a, like a slow fluctuation over time and we can see how this slow fluctuation kind of propagates through a slow fluctuation in growth rate. Uh, so we, we see that uh, molecular fluctuations move on to, um, to more physiological fluctuations um, and, and, and we can look at different kinds of uh, macro variables in our cell. Right, um, now this is hugely inefficient and um, uh, we have to, in each of those cell cycles, we have to uh, simulate uh, the production of millions of molecules. So this is um, computationally infeasible and that's why we also looked at some, oops, yeah, some approximation um, method for that. Um, again, just, I'll, I'll just quickly go over this. Um, so here um, we have our, our variables, which are the molecule numbers of different ty of n types. Um, each of those molecules uh, is associated with a certain mass. And I'll remind you that um, in, in the current setting, we're only considering that proteins have mass. Um, and, um, and then uh, we can sum up the masses of all the proteins to, to arrive to the total mass of the cell. And, <coughs> and then um, assuming that uh, mass is, density is fixed and mass is proportional to volume, we can look at the concentrations of different, um, of, uh, uh, of different species and also write down the cellular growth rate uh, as, as the rate at, um, at uh, which mass is being produced. Okay. Now, um, the first approximation that we do is that we assume that those concentrations, although they are discrete, of course, um, they are continuous, and, um, and uh, if, if we ignore division, and, and, and growth for a moment, and this is just uh, a standard set of uh, chemical Langevin equations. Um, but of course we have division and, and growth, and, and so we have some extra terms in our equation which account for the, um, the dilution of species through growth, um, the biomass production, as well as the partitioning uh, of the cellular contents um, at growth. Uh, we also do have uh, an equation for the mass, um, and that overall gives us a, a couple set of Langevin equations, which we still cannot solve. Um, so we did another um, approximation here, which is basically our small noise approximation, where we say that fluctuations are small as compared to our system size, so basically our M is typically very large. That's what we assume, and then we can derive some closed form estimates um, that allow us really to do, um, to, to use this model um, effectively. So, um, so by, by being able to solve this model uh, quickly, we can do uh, data, we, we can integrate different kinds of data and, and estimate parameters, we can analyze the model, and, and we can test different kinds of hypotheses, as I will show you now. Right, so the, the data that we integrated is a mix of population bulk data. Um, so this is uh, the data that we've seen uh, over and over again, so the data from Matt Scott's paper uh, on um, uh, mean growth rates and, um, and ribosomal contents, as well as single cell uh, growth data and uh, um, the, the fluctuations in terms of uh, the coefficient of variation uh, of the growth rate in different growth conditions. So um, we, we were able to fit 
the data um, uh, that, that we used, and then we, we used the, the inferred model to, to do some sort of sanity check um, uh, on how, how we're able to reproduce uh, independent data. So one thing that we looked at is um, basically the, uh, the unit size of the cell, so that's the size uh, of a cell per, um, per number of origins, DNA origins, replication origins, and, and this has been observed to be fairly constant over different conditions, which is what we reproduce. This is not a surprise because it's, it's um, a consequence of the Donaghy model that we assume for uh, the cell cycle um, and DNA replication. But when we, um, but when we um, looked at our estimates of the unit size, which were in the units of amino acids incorporated into the proteome, uh, compared to uh, volume, then actually we could, uh, uh, we could see that we're reproducing very nicely uh, the prote protein density um, that's been uh, estimated in the literature. Um, we also looked at cell mass, which we're uh, producing very nicely. So we typically um, assumed here the black ones. Oh, I forgot to say, sorry. Um, so the different things that you see here is the, the squares are always the data that we use. Um, the dots um, are stochastic simulations. Um, and the line is, uh, is the small noise approximation that we use, which, um, which agrees very well with the stochastic simulation, just as a sanity check. Um, so um, for the cell mass, um, in, in most of our uh, um, simulations, we used um, um, a, a C plus D period of 60 minutes. Um, and there was uh, another um, set of data where they had observed a longer C plus D period. So when we inserted that, uh, we could reproduce also that set of data quite well. And then um, I was very glad to see Ludovico's talk the other day, um, um, which made me understand why our um, predictions of um, total mRNA in different growth rates have, have this uh, uh, linear um, type of um, uh, growth uh, uh, across different conditions. So I haven't updated here um, the, uh, the, the data values yet to the newer estimates. Um, so this is uh, from the Bremer and Dennis um, data, which were indirect measurements. Right. So this makes us confident that the model does something right. Um, and, and, and so we went on to actually analyze um, um, where the noise comes from um, um, that, that we're observing. So um, maybe as a first observation, one prediction of the model is that, um, that the noise for maximal growth rate goes to zero. So a question that I always get is, um, so does that mean that there are no fluctuations anymore? I have a question that's not this question. Okay. So your, your model should give a prediction for the effective noise uh, of the growth rate on um, uh, along a lineage of single cells. So is it additive or a mixture of additive multiplicative? Did you, did you look at that? Um, no, we didn't. Um, so the other question I get um, is um, that um, noise goes down to zero, which, um, which doesn't mean that there are no fluctuations in the cell anymore. Um, it basically means that we're now in saturated levels of the growth rate where fluctuations don't lead to changes in the growth rate anymore. And so we do not observe noise in the growth rate anymore. And then um, um, the, our noise de decomposition, um, so basically the, the noise that is predicted by the model, we can decompose into the contributions of different reactions uh, that cause that noise. And, and basically one prediction that was made by the model is that throughout 
um, basically all of the uh, growth conditions, we have half of the noise um, coming from um, um, basically uh, the, the part, uh, like the, the, the decay of mRNAs, and, and that is either through mRNA degradation or, or through uh, the partitioning at, um, at division, and the other half is coming through their production. Um, now, this is just any type of mRNA, but we can also further pin that down. And, and one thing uh, that we found when asking which mRNAs are causing uh, the, the growth noise was that this is quite condition dependent. So basically, when we assumed um, um, that, that we have one rate limiting step uh, in, in the import of the nutrient, so this is the slowest reaction here, then basically the, the model predicted that all of the noise pretty much comes from the mRNA that, uh, that produces this transporter here. And, um, and then conversely, if, uh, if uh, the, the, the metabolic enzyme that converts the, the internal nutrient uh, to, to energy um, is the rate limiting step, the rate limiting step then, um, then all of the noise came from the mRNA for, for this uh, enzyme. Now, um, since ribosomes are so essential to growth, we also asked if, if ribosomes were maybe able to produce the, the observed uh, levels of noise. And in principle, that was sort of possible, um, but it meant that, um, that mRNAs um, coding for, for uh, ribosomal proteins had to be at extremely low levels and that those, the, the blue ones here, didn't agree with uh, uh, values that had been reported in the literature, whereas values that uh, we estimated in, in those two conditions actually had a, a fairly good agreement. So we could kind of discard this, this hypothesis here. Um, right. Um, so we, we can look at the sources of noise here, uh, but we can also look at how initial fluctuations, those sources, kind of trickle through uh, the growth apparatus of the cell. Um, I actually didn't want to talk about this because it always takes a long time to explain. Um, so basically, I will just sketch it, and if, uh, if you're interested in how, um, how we did that precisely, then talk to me or, or check out our paper. Um, so basically, this is looking at the stochastic simulations and, um, and then uh, um, uh, computing the cross-correlation between species. And then uh, based on the lag time between different species, we build those kind of um, uh, minimal delay graphs. So basically, uh, species that are next to each other in this graph have a minimal delay between uh, um, um, uh, in, in their correlation. And, and we interpret that as uh, uh, it's the species that fe first feels a fluctuation in the other, uh, in the other um, species. And, and now the reason I wanted to mention this was uh, because Dan gave this very beautiful talk yesterday about how uh, growth rate uh, should um, influence the switching rate uh, between different phenotypes. And, um, and perhaps like um, at, at a mechanistic level, um, um, one, one thing that we found uh, was that, um, that growth rate was never at the bottom um, of, of, of the propagation. So it was not a pure receiver of noise um, in, uh, in, in this propagation. Rather, it was usually quite high up and it would transmit noise to a lot of downstream processes, which also means that if there are some, um, some switching um, uh, um, gene systems that, I don't know, um, uh, switch between persistence uh, and susceptibility, 
um, those could be uh, um, affected by the, no, uh, the, the noise that is transmitted through growth rate, which would be higher at lower growth rates. Right, and finally, um, I wanted to talk about antibiotic responses. So the stochastic model um, can reproduce as well uh, the, the, um, the inhibition uh, data through chloramphenicol. This is no surprise because the deterministic model did that already, and here we're looking at the average responses of, of uh, the stochastic model. Um, we also looked at uh, this in, in more detail, so how uh, different, like the whole space of different nutrient qualities and um, chloramphenicol doses, how that affected average growth rate. We didn't see any surprises here, so basically with higher nutrient quality, growth rate goes up, and with uh, increasing antibiotic dose, growth rate goes down. Now, what was actually quite surprising to us was how complex the, uh, the noise landscape was. So basically the heterogeneity in growth rate, which might um, indicate that cells that ex exhibit different growth rates um, might also uh, exhibit tolerance when they are exposed to antibiotics. So here we saw that this was um, a highly non-monotonic landscape, and, and basically if, if we're looking at any fixed uh, nutrient condition in, in this range here, and we're kind of in this context thinking as a nutrient and condition as um, a location in the body where we have an infection or so, um, so those, those might be very different in terms of nutrients uh, if it's in the bladder or if it's in the stomach or so. Um, so if we look at any different, uh, any fixed um, nutrient condition, then increasing uh, the antibiotic do dose doesn't have the expected effect of um, monotonically increasing uh, noise because this is what we expect from what we've seen before, that at lower growth rates, we, ex we, see, um, we see higher noise. But rather, we see that actually um, um, we might be initially going up in noise, and then the noise, uh, the, the fluctuations take a dip. So meaning that actually there's, for many conditions, there's this um, non-zero uh, antibiotic dose um, that minimizes uh, the, um, the, the growth heterogeneity, which might be something desirable when we're uh, trying to um, uh, uh, devise a treatment strategy that uh, minimizes the possibility of, of um, um, invoking tolerance. Right. Um, so with that, um, I'm coming to the end, and, and basically the uh, key messages that I'd um, like you to take home is that um, by looking at those cellular mechanisms, uh, key cellular mechanisms, and the kinds of constraints that we considered, we were able to capture funda the, the fundamental growth relations that we've been talking all week about. Um, um, and and this, this mechanistic approach gives us a lot of flexibility um, to modularly um, study uh, different uh, systems of, um, of interest and, uh, and their emergent growth responses. And, and that um, also that, that this kind of stochastic framework that we developed, um, I think is very powerful to, um, to, um, to um, um, pinpoint sources of noise, integrate different kinds of data, and then analyze how this noise uh, propagates through the cell and, and what kind of uh, potential consequences this might have. And uh, with that, I'd like to finish and thank you for your attention. Um, we have time for questions. Uh, yeah, thank you for your talk. Um, and thank you for putting in the slide on the noise transmitter. Uh, which is the growth rate. Um, I was uh, wondering, you have this coarse grained model, of course, and that also make your mRNA level per gene, I guess, 
quite high compared to it, what it would normally be per gene. Do you think this would um, really change the model if you have uh, mRNAs that are most of the time zero? Can you still do the small noise approximation, for example? Um, yes, we can. I mean, so I I would assume that if we if we inserted now some sort of circuit of interest, um, then uh, and we would reestimate the different um, um, like expression parameters of the different sectors, I would assume that um, by fitting uh, the the um, the actual system that we're uh, investigating, then we will get much, um, much higher expression levels on the other sectors. About the noise you have is uh, when you add antibiotics, uh, the, there is a very sharp transition increase in noise at a very high concentration of antibiotics. Is that uh, increased due to that you have a growth rate equals to zero, or is there, is there another reason? Um, well, we think uh, actually in that regime, we're, we're getting into what we investigated before, this ribosome limiting regime, when we get noise and ribosome availability, um, um, as well as getting very close to zero, yes. So in your model, you can, let's say the deterministic one, you can measure um, the fraction of ribosomes that are translating a particular gene or set of genes um, and, and ask whether it's the ratio of uh, uh, messengers of that particular class of genes or genes to the total. Um, is, it, is it? And uh, do you have regimes where it's different things? I'm not sure I understand. So you can, what is, okay, what is the fraction of ribosomes that are translating a certain gene or class of genes in your model? Yeah. And how it's related to messenger con concentrations? Did you, did you look into that? Well, I mean, we, we, we just have mass action binding and unbinding, so it is completely related to the relative abundance of, of the mRNA. But because you have the complete law of mass action, you could have different regimes probably. And um, I was wondering if you get to different regimes or not. Um, in terms of what Ludovico, for example. Yeah, for example, yes. uh, yeah, we, so, we make I mean, some I was, assumptions. I was very glad to, to hear his explanation because it made me understand much better uh, why we're seeing this and, and that actually what he, uh, what, what he presented um, made a lot of sense to me because we did actually, um, because we're modeling the, um, the binding explicitly, we, we, we do have, we do account for kind of this complex formation uh, uh, regime. Um, and, and then uh, as far as I understood, um, like the linearity um, was only explained if at the same time the um, the elongation rate uh, increases, right? So, I, and this is also something that we had included already in our kind of energy dependence. Okay, thank you. Okay, one last question by Terry, and then uh, um, we can see. From your description, it, it sounds like you're probably not aware of our recent work on the total mRNA uh, measurements, right? I'm not That's fine. I mean, the, but then the, from that study, we were able to